namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Namaste. So in this series, we have referred to Nibbana by various what we call epithets, like Akata, the unmade, or Asankata, the unfabricated, the unborn, Ajatta. Huh? These aren't exactly synonyms, they're metaphors. And they are like reflections of Nibbana in the mirror of language. And of course, the problem is language is imperfect. <laughs> language is dualistic by its very nature because the common tongue in every part of the world is adapted to unenlightened people who have to communicate about worldly things. And so the assumption behind all languages that I know of is there is a doer and there is an object and there is somebody doing something to the object and like that. So because of that, we get uh, linguistic constructions like I want to see Nibbana. I want to go to Nibbana. I want to attain Nibbana or get Nibbana <laughs> as if it's an ordinary object of this world. But it's not. So the Buddha invented a special language of more than 33 metaphors by which he refers to Nibbana in his sermons. And this concept of Nibbana is always in the background. It's always the subtext of any teaching made by the Buddha. Even though he may not mention it directly, still all of his teaching is about Nibbana and how to attain it. Here's an exchange, for example, between the Buddha and a demigod named Kakuddha. And Kakuddha asks the Buddha, do you rejoice, O recluse? And the Buddha retorts, on getting what, friend? Then the deity asks, then recluse, do you grieve? And the Buddha quips back, on losing what, friend? So the deity concludes, well then, recluse, you neither rejoice nor grieve. And the Buddha replies, that is so, friend. Now the deep meaning of this is that although the word Nibbana could imply losing something, because it means going out in the sense of a fire being extinguished, but actually, in realizing Nibbana, nothing is lost except some illusory suffering. <laughs> and nothing is gained because whatever there is, is simply a reflection, an illusion of Nibbana. And Nibbana has been there all along. See, just like Turiya consciousness is there in everybody in everything, Brahman. Huh? So in the same way, Nibbana is everywhere, in everything. Everybody has it. Everybody knows it, whether they realize it or not. That's the other thing. So Buddha shows that ordinary language doesn't really apply. It's not that you lose something or gain something by realizing Nibbana. So to avoid this problem, the Buddha uses epithets. 
And these are metaphorical words or statements that refer to Nibbana without mentioning it directly. And you can find many, many of these in the sutras if you look deep. Here's a good example. Monks, I will teach you the unconditioned. And what is the path that leads to the unconditioned? The Noble Eightfold Path. This is called the path that leads to the unconditioned. So, monks, I've taught you the unconditioned and the path that leads to the unconditioned. Out of compassion, I've done what a teacher should do who wants what's best for his disciples. Here are these roots of trees, and here are these empty huts. Practice absorption, mendicants. Don't be negligent. Don't regret it later. This is my instruction to you. He doesn't refer to Nibbana by name, but rather by its various epithets. And this continues in the next verses. Monks, I will teach you the uninclined, the undefiled, the truth, the far shore, the subtle, the very hard to see, the unaging, the constant, the not falling apart, the invisible, the unproliferated, the peaceful, the deathless, the sublime, the state of grace, the sanctuary, the ending of craving, the incredible, the amazing, the untroubled, the not liable to trouble, the extinction, the unafflicted, dispassion, purity, freedom, the not adhering, the island, the protection, the shelter, the refuge. So with each one of these terms, he expands it. That's what the ellipses mean in the text, that he expands each one of these epithets just as he has with the unconditioned in the previous quote. For example, monks, I will teach you the uninclined. And what is the path that leads to the uninclined? The Noble Eightfold Path. This is called the path that leads to the uninclined. So, monks, I've taught you the uninclined and the path that leads to the uninclined, and so on. But the thing that's missing between the lines here is the Buddha's presence, the Buddha's silence, his no mind, his goneness. Huh? Sugato. He's so gone. That means there, there is no person there. There is no mind there. But the words of the Buddha are coming directly out of silence, out of Nibbana. So this is what makes this teaching effective, that the Buddha is exemplifying Nibbana in his very presence, in his manner, in his energy, in his poise, and in his bliss. So when he talks about Nibbana by using a metaphor, an epithet, the monks can see directly in front of them what this epithet really means. It's not just an abstract, like something out there, you know. Oh yeah, I'm going to Nibbana, I'm going to attain Nibbana someday. Huh? No, Nibbana is right there in front of them. Nibbana is speaking to them. And the ones who were already realized could see that. But it still had an effect even on the ones who weren't realized. This is the secret of the Buddha's success. He had the power to attract and then to show directly 
Nibbana. And Ramana Maharshi had this too. Ramana could sit someone down and enfold their mind in his mind and actually give them the experience of realization, of Turiya, of deep silence, no mind, no thought. He could do this because he was realized himself, so he had that power. And anyone who is realized has that power to the degree that they have realized Nibbana. So Nibbana, by definition, is ineffable, indescribable by words. So the Buddha and his disciples use this language of epithets, metaphors, to discuss Nibbana. There's a very wonderful encounter between the Buddha and one young student. And this student used Deepa, which means island, to refer to Nibbana. This is the verse that he uh, put before the Buddha. Unto them that stand midstream, when the frightful floods flow forth, to them in decay and death forlorn, an island, sire, may you proclaim, an island which none else excels, yea, such an isle, pray tell me, sire. And the Buddha gives his answer in two wonderful verses. Unto them that stand midstream, when the frightful floods flow forth, to them in decay and death forlorn, an island, Kappa, I shall proclaim. Owning naught, grasping naught, this isle is this, none else besides. Nibbana, that is how I call that isle, where decay is decayed and death is dead. This is an amazing, amazing sutta. Uh, the island is non-grasping and non-clinging. Of course, these are also <laughs> descriptions of Nibbana. Huh? That non-clinging, non-grasping, non-fabrication, huh? non-doing, unborn, unmade, unfabricated. These are all descriptors of Nibbana showing something about it because it can't be really described directly. But these are gateways, these are doors, these metaphors that anyone can use to attain Nibbana for themselves. Akinchanam means owning nothing. Anadanam means grasping nothing. Etang deepam anapanam. This is the island, nothing else. Nibbanam itinang brumi jarama puchikayam. And I call Nibbana, where decay is decayed and death is dead. In other words, Nibbana is the extinction of decay and death. Only that which is unborn and unfabricated can be free from decay and death. Only that is without beginning can also be without end. So that's why when we're in meditation, we practice neti neti. We're going not this, not that, not this other thing, not those things, because they all have a beginning Therefore, they must have an end. This is such a deep topic. There's so many sutras and so many wonderful ideas and concepts coming from the Buddha, which unfortunately in modern Buddhism are largely misunderstood. I was very, very, very fortunate to come in contact with Bhikkhu Jnanananda Katakurunde Nyanananda, not the other Nyanananda. <laughs> and 
he showed me the real meaning of these sutras. And because of that, I was able to attain all the path realizations. And now I'm offering them to you. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum.